Right, so I just want to do a recap on cyclohexane, uh, cyclohexane uh, chair conformations. Uh, and I've drawn out just a cyclohexane that's been substituted. Sorry, it is a little bit small here, but we have a T-butyl group, we've got a hydroxyl group, and we have, that's a chlorine over there. Um, and um, what I want, we need to be able to draw out cyclohexane chairs uh, on a flat piece of paper, um, with the understanding, of course, that we, we, we recognize that this molecule is a three-dimensional structure. So I, I've built a model here, all right? Here's, here's a model of this uh, particular cyclohexane chair. So if we look at the top like that, it's, it's very flat. Um, we don't get any sense of the three-dimensional um, proportions with that. But all of these are sp3 carbons, and in order to be in a ring like this, they can't just be perfectly flat. Um, there's a three-dimensional uh, structure to this, and, and you would have seen this last year in, uh, in, in second year. And so if we look at it exactly at an angle like that, we can see that the six-membered ring has a what is described as a chair. It looks like a bit of a, a lazy chair that you would suntan on. All right, so <clears throat> we can look at it like that, but um, if we're to draw out this, looking directly at this side, it's just going to as I say, look something like that, which is going to be uh, not too easy to see what's going on. If we kind of just twist it slightly at an angle um, to what it is at the moment, you can see now um, the the back line, all right, that's coming out, and we get to see this kind of shape um, of the chair a bit more clearly. So we can see the carbons at the back, we see the carbons in the front, um, all right. And um, <clears throat> but one of the things is we should also look at the way that we are looking at this. Uh, or we'll consider the things uh, on this chair. Is notice how all the bonds are connected to each other. So, so this bond over here of the chair, whoops, in the front, uh, is parallel to the one at the back. All right, this is just because of geometry, but the this bond here is also parallel to that bond over there. There's a very good reason for that, and it's again just because of geometry. And that is, if we look down this bond here, which we're going to do we see that this over here, which is the chlorine, is anti-periplanar to this carbon-carbon bond over here. All right, the bonds are anti-periplanar to each other, and that is why they must be parallel to each other. Notice that because of geometry, all of these things apply across the, the, the whole molecule. So um, this one is parallel to the back, which is parallel to the front, which is also parallel to this T-butyl group over there. And at some point, I managed to lose this little hydrogen. We'll move it out of the way. Uh, okay, so um, likewise, <clears throat> the this hydrogen that's over here, which is kind of facing sort of up, needs to also be um, anti-periplanar to something else. In fact, it should be anti-periplanar to this little hydrogen that fell out. So we stick him back in. Um, and if we just turn it slightly like that, we see, I have to do a bit of a twisting, um, but this one and this one should be parallel to each other. Not exactly, but all right. And so we can look at that. Also, let's look at the, we're looking at the cyclohexane ring from um, sort of, you know, down the side of the other. So we're missing the two, you know, these two carbons are overlapping each other. Notice how that's anti-parallel, that's um, anti-periplane over there. This one going up, that one going up at the back. And then this one over here is anti-periplane to that one. All right, that's pointing down. And these ones that are going straight up and straight down are the axial positions. We call so, so the one over here is in front of us, okay, is axial up and axial down. So if we just go back to putting this um, ring on the uh, piece of paper like that, um, it, these ones are the axial ones are pointing up and down. Um, and this one is pointing uh, down over here, and this one is down as well. Uh, now just look at the shape of the ring. All right, relative to this piece of paper. All right, we've got a straight line over here, and the axial parts are going straight down, so that 90 degrees to this line, and they're going straight up over there. And look at how this chair is aligned. All right, these bonds here are not parallel to this piece of paper. So when we start drawing chair structures, often a chair structure that people draw and they think they're kind of getting it right is they draw something that looks like that, all right? Sorry, that's very light. I'm just going to draw that in darker. Um, they draw this, and they think, 
oh, I'm a genius, I've just drawn a perfect chair. And the answer is, no, you haven't, because this line is parallel to the bottom of the paper over there. Now, you might think I'm being pedantic, but just see what happens over here. When we look at this chair, all right, this position over here, this chlorine group, is actually slightly below the plane, and it is equatorial position, it's equatorial down. The one over here is above the plane, this sort of flat line, all right, it's above the, um, this uh, uh, plane, and it is equatorial up. If we draw this chair with the lines in the plane, like this, look what has just happened to those equatorial positions. They're now in the plane. So we can say this is equatorial, but is it up or is it down? I don't know. All right, you shouldn't either. So when we draw our chairs, we have to be at the angle like that. All right, so we want these positions going at 90 degrees to the, the plane. Okay, so how do we draw chairs? We need to do this properly, neatly. I'm going to show you one way of doing it. I've heard of people just making themselves a little cutout uh, um, thing out of uh, cardboard. For instance, this one is the right sort of shape. We would just have to turn it a bit to get it uh, right. Um, but here's a simple way of doing it that uh, for people starting out can be very useful. So take a piece of lined paper uh, and draw a a V on it, all right? Using the lines as a guide, but kind of just go, uh, I'll start somewhere down here. So uh, head towards the middle of the lines and just draw a V going down towards it, something like that, all right? So you're using the line as a guide and the V is going about halfway down uh, between the two lines. And then at the line below that, all right, in line with this point, um, you do halfway, uh, put a put a dot and you're going to go down to that point over there on the line and just draw a, another uh, V. My lines aren't particularly straight. Um, and then, very magically, you can connect the two bits like that and you get your chair structure, which is perfectly aligned for filling in the axial and equatorial positions. All right. So <clears throat> if that helps you, Go and practice that. It's important that you can draw these chairs uh, uh, readily and quickly. You've got to understand how to do that. So going back to this, um, we know I, as I say, tend to just sketch out the chairs. I'm used to doing it, so I lightly draw the lines, and then I make sure that every single line that I'm that I draw, all right, is parallel to each other. This one is parallel to this one. This one over here, parallel to that one. And then it's very easy because all the equatorial positions must be parallel to one of these lines or one bond away from each other. So the equatorial position here has to be parallel to, to these two lines. So it's easy to put in. It just goes over there. Uh, the equatorial position over here must be parallel to these two lines. So it goes in over there. And so these equatorial positions are actually very easy to put in because they're all in line with that. Uh, these ones look like they're difficult, but we just follow the rule. Equatorial position must be in line. It must form like a Z. All right? It's got to be parallel to it. And likewise, there's the equatorial position over there. All right, And the axial positions are alternating. It's either... Um, it should be obvious that over here, axial has to go straight up. It can't be going straight down because that's just going to look funny. And if we look at the structure, um, that we had over here, the axial position, because this is a tetrahedral carbon. So the position for the hydrogen would be going straight up over there. All right. Another way to look at it is this point over here. This is where we're going to put the T-butyl group. Um, the hydrogen must be going straight down. So once you've got one point, it's easy. That's going straight up there. So over here must be going straight down. Over here, straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down. And there you have your chair. So <clears throat> we can draw this in its preferred uh, conformation. You should try and do that using this structure, fit in all the bits and pieces. The rule you must remember, this is so easy to make a mistake, is remember the way that we're looking at this, all right, the way you're seeing this, this structure at the moment is, if I twist it, you see, this part here is in front of us, all right? So if we, this part here is in front of us. This is part of the ring that we're looking at as you're going around. So when you number it, if we go one, two, three, four, five, six, we're going around in a clockwise direction. When we put the substituents in over here, we must number around in a clockwise direction. All right, we're going around in this direction. So if this is one, then we've got two, 
three, four, five, and six. Be very careful of going one, two, three, four, five, six in an anti-clockwise direction, because if you do that, you'll put the substituents in, you'll actually be making the enantiomer. You should go and try that for yourself if you don't believe me. All right, go and try and do that. Okay, so that's just the drawing of the rings. We're looking at kind of some stereochemical information, and I just want to, to show you using the model, um, when we looked at substitution reactions, SN2 reactions, I pointed out to you, so this green one is the chlorine, I pointed out to you that on cyclohexane rings, substitution must occur when the leaving group is in an axial position. Now I have a model in front of me, I can just show this out to you. So this is the preferred conformation of the cyclohexane ring because the T-butyl group is in an equatorial position. All right, so it's equatorial. The chlorine is in an equatorial position, and this OH over here happens to be in an axial position over there. All right, so we've got the molecule. Now, what I want you to appreciate is when for a nucleophile to kick out this leaving group, okay, it has to do it in an SN2 reaction, all right? Well, generally, these reactions are SN2. So the nucleophile comes in. It has to come in from behind the leaving group. Now, behind the leaving group is in this direction over here. It's got to do that, all right? Now, in order to do that, this pencil nucleophile is going to be bumping between these hydrogen groups that are coming in like that. You see that it's actually quite a sterically encumbered direction of attack doing, the, doing it this way. Now, we change the chlorine into the axial position. So we change it first into the boat. We've moved it up. See, this is the boat conformation, very high energy because now the chlorine and this hydrogen over there on the other side are bumping into each other. So this will swing down and we get ourselves in back into the chair conformation. This is the now the high, higher energy one. So if we look at it like that, we see the T-butyl is in an axial position and so is the chlorine. But now, uh, hopefully you can appreciate that... <clears throat> if I hold it like this, that the nucleophile coming in like this, it's a lot easier for it to do that, to attack from an axial position like that. All right, much easier than it was when it was in an equatorial position. Okay, so that is why on cyclohexane rings, axial attack is preferred when we are doing substitution uh, on uh, with the leading group. All right, I hope that helped you a little bit.